Song lines are invisible lines crisscrossing the whole of the Australian continent. They are far more than just navigational pathways. Embedded in the song lines and landscape is all the knowledge, data, information, behavioural patterns and spirituality of Australia's original inhabitants. The stories you will hear in this podcast series come from deep in the heart of the people who tell them. They're not my stories, I'm just a conduit, but as an Australian, they are my history. Come travel the song lines with us and learn about the real history of Australia and Earth's longest continuing ancient culture. Hello everyone. In this episode, I'm speaking with Associate Professor Dr. John Bradley, the author, along with Yanua families, of a most incredible book called Singing Saltwater Country, Journey to the Songlines of Carpentaria, the must-read for anyone even remotely interested in the fascinating concept of songlines. John was originally a school teacher, with his first posting being to Borroloola in the Northern Territory, near the Gulf of Carpentaria. During his time as a teacher, John defied the policy of the day by encouraging school children to speak their native language. John can speak Yanua and Creole languages fluently, and he is Mara and Garwa, and I apologise if I'm not pronouncing those names correctly. John has a PhD in anthropology and zoology with a focus on indigenous ways of understanding dugong and marine turtles. John is the Deputy Director of the Indigenous Studies Centre at Monash University in Melbourne and also Director of the Monash Country Lines Archive, whose projects include using computerised 3D animation to assist with the preservation of dreaming and other Indigenous stories and songs. As you would expect, before recording a podcast, I always have a preliminary chat with the person I'm going to be talking to. In this case, though, I'd no sooner introduced myself to the inimitable Dr. John Bradley and sat down than the conversation got extremely interesting. We started discussing the concept of song lines and how there is always commentary around songs and stories. However, when John said there are three different ways of understanding song lines, I quickly realised that our preliminary talk had jumped right to the crux of the podcast. I knew our listeners wouldn't want to miss any of this, so I hit the record button without formal intro or preliminaries so as not to interrupt this fascinating thought flow. Consequently, this episode takes off pretty quickly, so grab your headphones and settle back as John tells us about three different aspects necessary for an understanding of song lines. One is the sung text, you know, just the text of the song, yeah? Okay. The next thing that comes with after you've got the sung text is the commentary text mm. where people say what this verse is about. And interestingly enough for me, over the years as I've recorded song line after song line and verse after verse after verse, or what they call in Aboriginal English a leg, because these songs are moving, so it's your leg that's travelling, you're moving with it, people will give commentary. And the commentary when you first learn is always very simple. It might be just shark. No, okay. Okay, shark. <laughs> Then maybe a few years later or next year you hear it and go, ah, oh, that's this kind of shark. Then later it might be, it's that kind of shark and he's just come from that place. Then it might be later, well, you know, you've seen that ceremony now, so that's that kind of shark that came from that place and he was dancing that ceremony that you saw in that other place. So bit by bit, there's bigger vision of what these verses mean. And what's really interesting is it doesn't matter whether how many different men in one instance might tell you their commentary, there is always a very common thread as to what those verses are about. Mm-hmm. And then you get senior women, you know, women are not meant to know this stuff, who will also say, well, they're singing that shark, and you know, that shark's got that big business, but that shark they're singing is coming from this place. They've also, they also know, you know, this whole idea that women don't know these things is a bit mythological in itself, really. So then that's the second form of comment. You know, so you have the text, yep. you have the commentary, and then, of course, there are dreaming stories that relate to these things. You know, a lot of people think there's an immediate relationship between dreaming stories, a spoken story, and the song. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes oh. they're actually quite distinct things. Yep. And there's actually... And so people are always very clear to say whether what the, the relationship between the drawing, dreaming story is 
and the song. So, for example, one of the songs I know quite well is begins with the story of a tiger shark traveling through Yanua country. Travel, 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 travel. And it's a story about his travels and what he did. Then he gets to the place that he wants to call home. Mm -hmm. And then he stays there. Mm -hmm. Now, while he made that journey, he didn't sing a thing. Then he gets to his home, mm -hmm. which is on a riverbank. Then he stands up. This is me just telling the story. And he sings back over the country he traveled. Right. So mm -hmm. he's not traveling anymore at all. He's just then throwing his song out over the country he traveled. Where does it end up? Or from where he started, from where way, he way back. Started. So he's singing his journey backwards. Okay. And this happens quite often in Yanua country, at least, that there's not an immediate correlation between a dreaming path mm -hmm. and a song. In some instances there are, the dingo dreaming, for example, you know, the path of the story of the dingo, the song is following it directly. Right. No matter. You, you know exactly what's going on. There is one song line in, in Yanua country where the song actually is its own agency. You do say that somewhere There is nothing in book. carrying the song. The song has its own agency and force and power and travels over the country on its own. What's that song about? It, it's about all sorts of things because it's constantly describing the country it's traveling over. Yep. Um, the creeks, the savanna grasslands, the, uh, the messmate stringy bark forests. And then it will get to an important place or it will come across the path of a dreaming being and then it will sing that dreaming being in that place and what it's done and what it's doing there. Then it will leave that dreaming being and then it will move on to another place. Okay. And so the song itself has its own force. Now, I still don't really get my head around this, <laughs> but, you know, when you learn to sing these things, you sort of understand how it's working. But it throws it into a quandary, this whole idea that we live with, that there is this immediate and it, it totally linked relationship between the activities of these dreaming ancestors and song. Right. There is not yep. always. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes there is, but we cannot always say that's how it is. So, so the dreaming track or a dreaming path is from the ancestral being's, being's point of view. Yeah, and yep. sometimes and you can walk in there. Yeah, and you can follow, follow it, their, no follow, worries. Yep. Sometimes the song is the same. Yep. And then sometimes it's not, as in the tiger shark. Right. Now, this of course goes to one of the great myths around song lines, is that song lines are about, oh, if you know your song line, you know how to survive in country and you'll never get lost and everything will be well. Mm. Mm. Well, mm. <laughs> at one level, there's a little bit of truth to it. Yes, it sings water holes and rock holes. But unless you know that country as something physical and tangible, you still don't know much. Yeah. Like, you, can, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. you can get to a point where you can visit country and go, oh, that's that lagoon. Okay, so they sing that in the song line. I know that, that they do sing that lagoon. And then they get to another lagoon and it's up there somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can sort of... But, of course, in, a, in saltwater country and perhaps in big desert countries, some of these song lines cross into places where you're not going to find anything. You're not going to survive unless you've got an aqualung yeah. or unless you've got the biggest supply of water on your back that you can imagine. Because... You know, the tiger shark song I just mentioned, you know, it travels down into the bottom of the sea and travels the seagrass beds, mm -hmm. and then it will rise up to the top of the water and travel the top, then it will rise up into the sky and travel through the sky, then it will dive down again, and it does all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's certain key verses that all song lines contain that are repeated that tell you geographically what is happening, whether mm -hmm. it's ascending whether it's descending, whether it's a creek, whether it's a riverbank, there's all sorts of other verses that will appear that are always sung the same because it's hitting a part of a geography that can be described. That you could sort of follow. Yeah. Yep. That you know, ah, they're actually going down into a river here. Mm. You hear these verses and you go, ah, it's going down. Okay. And then you might hear, you know, another 10 verses on another set of verses that you go, Ah, it's going up. Mm -hmm. So the verses between going down and going up might be descriptions of the river that it's moving through, mm -hmm. the fish, the, the fish, the the reeds that grow on the riverbank, the tides that are moving in that river. 
So you'll get a whole collection of... So really what you've got in this instance is like a piece of string where two knots are markers of how that song is travelling. Yep. And the in-between part is about the contents of things. So, and from that in-between part, you could get a lot of day-to-day -day practical living. Well, you could yes, you or not, about or, species you know, like, and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah. And that's one of the Where reasons the I really got interested in song lines because right back in the beginning is because people would sing these things and then say, ah, oh, that animal doesn't live here anymore. We don't know where that animal went. Right. And, so you, and then even, ah, oh, we used to see that seagrass everywhere, but it's gone. Yeah. Yep. And so you started to see these song lines also, if you like, as an ecological ribbon. Mm. And things were missing. Right. Yep. Extinction had taken place. Yep. And so they became really clear markers for me that there were certain things that were good and well in country, but mm. there were certain things that were no longer. Like when people sing possum verses these days, they would just say, we haven't seen a possum for years. Right. Yeah. Where's yep. that possum gone? We don't know. And is... One of the things I was going to ask you about, and I don't know if this actually slots in here, but um, song lines getting broken, and of course well, all over the country, you're talking more in song lines northern is a Australia. Very particular, I don't know how often it's used in other places. It's a very particular annual way of talking about a song line when development takes place on top of a song line, yep. i.e. Uh, a township, a fishing club, a road goes through it. And there's always a quandary as to whether the song can actually be healed, whether it's still possible to sing as broken song. So that's one kind of broken song where you see the song is broken by something physical. Yeah. Now, nine times out of ten, people say, oh, we can still sing it. You know, the song's deep underground in there. We can still bring it through. Mm -hmm. The other kind of broken song is for song lines where people remember maybe the beginning of it. They might remember the end of it, but they don't remember what's in the middle. Mm -hmm. So it is actually physically Got, its memory got, is broken. Gone with people who have passed, yeah, passed exactly, on. Yeah, exactly, and people haven't learnt it quickly enough. And in an area of the Gulf where frontier violence was so prevalent mm. and welfare violence was so prevalent, this is not uncommon. Mm. So mm. broken songs are actually sort of of, a, of two kinds. One, where the, the earth or the land has been physically changed. Interfered with, yeah. Interfered with. Or where there's a gap in knowledge because... People have died before things have been passed on. So mm. this notion of a broken, sometimes in Yanya they say a torn song. Okay. But, okay. yeah, broken songs is twofold. But that's not really what you were talking about when you were saying some of the animals and things become no, extinct. No, that's they... not broken. They're not broken. It's just that they still know the songs for them. They still know those things once lived in that country, but where are they now? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes people say, we'd like to see that animal back here. Mm. How do we get him back? Is there an answer for that? <laughs> well, I don't know. In the desert, there was a very similar thing done a few years ago where people actually said, you know, we want our emus back in our country mm. and we want our possums back in our country yep. and we want our rock wallabies back in our country because we've got all the songs and there's dreaming places for them, but they will disappear and they actually reintroduce them. Okay. Yep. Now, so technically yes. you can, but it depends on the status of the country as to where they need to be introduced. Mm. And, you know, for example, quolls, the little spotted quoll, is sung in song lines and people know that it is on Van Lin Island, the biggest <laughs> island in the Pelu group on Yanua country. But we also know that quolls eat cane toads. And when quolls eat cane toads, they die. Mm. So, you know, I remember talking about this a long, long time ago with people when the cane toads first came through. And they said, well, but we'll still have the song, but that animal won't be there. Mm. Mm. So this is where an interesting relationship between Western biological sciences mm. and indigenous knowledge is actually starts to sit together quite nicely mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of, well, what are the song lines saying about that existed and what is it still existing today? Well, that's your job, go and find out. That's, and what are your theories about why these animals become extinct? Right, so that was nearly towards the end of my questions that I was going to ask you. you know, know, is there something that we can do? Well, there's debate about it. Using this. the ancient knowledge to go Well, forward. I think there is, but it's also convincing some scientists, you know, Western ways of knowing in some respects of the antithesis of this way of knowing. Mm, mm. So you've really got to find the scientist that's actually prepared to say, I'm prepared to go with you Yes. see. Mm. And I've seen some dreadful debates, like two stick out in my mind. is one, Yanua people vow and declare there are two kinds of bandicoots that lived in their country. And they're sung in the song lines and they're described and people can describe those bandicoots. Western scientific knowledge says, no, there was only ever one species here. 
Yeah, yeah. And so you've got a vocabulary, say in the dictionary, of these bandicoots. You've got song lines that speak to these bandicoots. You've got a Western commentary that says, sorry guys, there's only one species. Now, an interesting event happened a few years or a number of years ago now where a ecologist came to Borola with stuffed animals, mounted animals in boxes to try and work out whether these animals still existed. Mm. Now, the first box he brought out was this debated species of bandicoot. And as soon as it was brought out, some of the old men started to sing it and said, we know this animal. Right. There it is. Mm. Where, where did it go away from? And the ecologist at the time was going, but it's not meant to be in this country. Well, we, <laughs> we know this animal. Yep, yep. yep. So you yep. get that. And I've had this happen with a number of shark species and also with a small blossom bat that was just not considered to live in the your country at all. But, mm. Mm. And the reason that debate arose is just outside of Darwin is a really a wildlife park of animals from the Northern Territory. It's got a great nighttime room, you know, where you can go and see nighttime species, Lovely. nocturnal mm. species. Mm. And I went with a lot of old men and women, and they loved it. You know, they're seeing these animals in the round, in the flesh, naming them, singing them, and we got to a blossom bat, and this old lady said, oh, that, we called that one that, and this old man sang the song for it, and the biologist from behind said, yeah, but it's not been recorded in your country. Yeah, yeah. well, it has been. And this old lady just said, well, yeah. we call it this, we know this thing, and it lives in this kind of country, and it but this is the debate, you know, mm, yep, this yep. is the dominance of a Western way of knowing until we can say it exists. Yep, yep. Everything else you've got is hearsay. Yeah, yeah. No, I have a similar thing, you know, working in environmental law and um, the mapping, you know, this is in Queensland, so they are mapping would sort of say these are uh, koala trees, you, certain eucalypts, uh -huh. this whole area, you can't clear it, which is fine, but um, it's koala trees. But the people who've been doing selective logging, because that's what it was back then for, you know, decades, they sort of said, we've never seen a koala here, <laughs> you know. Okay, then the scientists might say that they're, they're good for the koalas, yeah. but go tell the koalas that. We've well, never I, seen one Well, here. this is always the big contestation, isn't it? You know, this is where, you know, I often think when I think about some lines and stuff, my father is a farmer, and he's a very old farmer. Mm -hmm. But you walk across that property with him, he has ways of knowing that place in in very intimate and emotional detail yeah. that in some respects nearly equates to what you experience with a lot of older indigenous people mm -hmm. because they've just built up decades upon decades of knowledge and seasonal understandings and you know it's not just the head at work mm -hmm. you know, and I think this is where right. this whole view of Descartes just needs to be torn apart mm -hmm. you know I think therefore I am well I actually think when we start thinking about song lines or this kind of knowledge it's a think therefore I don't because therefore I'm not. I'm therefore not. I'm exactly. misidentifying Because your whole am. body becomes mm. the site of learning. Yep. It's a whole bodily experience of being in what we call an environment. Yep. Yep. And that's what some lines have taught me. It isn't just this voice that's singing. It is a total bringing together of all kinds of experiences. Mm, 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 and mm. that's why older people will often critique younger people who are learning to sing, saying, yeah, well, it's right, you can sing. And then they'll say in English, you know, but you don't know the country yet, which is a way of saying you haven't experienced the very country you're singing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've talked to these young fellas that have managed to hold on to one song line, and they'll say, you know, and I've taken them to country that they could sing perfectly. Mm -hmm. But once they knew what that country looked like, it was like another layer of meaning was added because now when you're singing it, you're actually seeing it. You mm -hmm. know, and that's what an old man, and as I mentioned in that book, when you sing these song lines, it's like you've got to have a TV on your head. You've got to be able to envision what you're singing because you've experienced what you're singing. Mm, you know, mm. you've got to know that country. Mm, it becomes mm. a much more powerful thing. You're not just singing in song abstraction. Mm, You're not mm. just singing words that you know about that are about a country in absentia. Mm, mm. You actually can enter that country. You know that country. The scent the feeling, mm -hmm. the bushfires, the rainstorms, all the things that get sung in the song lines, if you've experienced them over that country, then it becomes a much more powerful event. Mm -hmm. you know, the thrashing of a hammerhead shark as it's eating its prey, any of these things that are all sung about, you know, mm -hmm. the surfacing of dugong, the thrashing of the dugong's tail in the water. You know, this is the big difference, I think, with in Yanyo, for example, you can't say you know anything until you've actually experienced it. 
Right. There is no way, like I remember That's when I, I first went to Borough I said, oh, I know about you all. Because I'd read about them. I'd never seen one. Yeah. And I'd read about them, I'd seen photos of them. You know, so in a Western way, I knew about yep. them. Yep. Yep. And I was, no. I can still remember, I was met with sort of these people looking at me like, yeah. <laughs> okay. knowing damn well that I, in their view, I didn't. Then about two years later, I had my arm badly broken by a jubile. Right, tell us that story later. Really but badly yeah. broken. And this old man looked at me and he said, now you know jubile. Oh, right. How did you get your arm broken by a jubile? Oh, the heart room got wrapped around my arm. Oh, she pulled. And pulled. Yeah, not good. And, um, and so, you know, it's like in my classes, I often say, how many of you people in this room have ever smoked? And these days there's a gasp whenever you mention smoking. And a few brave souls will put their hand up. And I say, well, technically, in a younger way, I understand you are the only people that understand smoking. Right. Because you've done it. Mm. You can actually say it's an experience you know. Yep. Yep. Everyone else in this room has been, has swallowed the propaganda that it's bad. Mm -hmm. But none of you know about nicotine rush. None of you know that it actually stops hunger. None of you know any of these things because it's a theory. No. Yep, yep. Mm. And the annual people are very clear about that. You know, they'll often say, you say you know, how do you know? Yep. Or if you sing Sunline verses, people say, how do you know that? Where did it come from? Who gave it to you? Mm -hmm. And this is becoming an increasing issue for younger people when so much of their Sunlines have now been documented by me. Mm -hmm. People are making this thing, well, where did you learn it? We're relying on, relying yeah, on, on paper text. And yeah. you know, relying on paper text is a completely different version of, of a truth, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Look, I know what you're saying. In, in a way, I know what you're saying there because we're now... Well, my thing is I came looking for Aboriginal culture because, I, one, I wanted to see what the history of the Sunshine Coast was and also to the you know, devastation of the environment over the last couple of hundred years. I thought we need to go back. And I really thought, too, the Western society um, has somehow lost a connection with something. I wasn't really sure what that something was. So, But I went to the – where did I go? I went to the library, the local library. What's the Aboriginal – you know what's the Aboriginal story here? What's the real history? So, and I, you know, didn't find anything much at all. And then I went to other books. Will's being one of the amazing ones that I've read. But yeah, then I realised I have to go and I have to talk to Aboriginal people or Indigenous people. And then even when I do, I get told little things, not little bits, but I get told things. And you sort of go away and you come back and you think, oh wow. It's it, a constant putting together of a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, yeah. But also. As Deborah Bird Rose talks about, when we meet with Indigenous people and talk with Indigenous people, sometimes we also strike what she calls the wounded places. Oh, definitely. Where we know that the colonial impact has been so great mm -hmm. that there's nothing there. Well, I, like I said, I went looking for environmental mm -hmm. fix, you might say, but I found, I found tragedy and trauma. Of course, absolutely. Yeah. Tragedy and trauma. That's what occupies those wounded places yeah yeah and in some respects broken songs are wounded places yeah you know it's where the impact has been severe mm, mm. and so we then reconcile ourselves to that in all sorts of ways like victoria for example you know was colonized within 10 years yeah and powerfully so and then when you get people rounded off their own country put into reserves put into mission stations what becomes important is just survival yeah. And it's one yep. of the reasons then you get this dramatic decrease in spoken language, performance arts, songs, all these things just there's no time. We just gotta survive. That's right, yep, yep. And in that survival there is something always maintained. But there's a lot that is you know Well I think think you say in your book I think you say in your book that you know people were flogged if the kids were well, flogged if they my, spoke you know, their own I went language. To Borrow, of course as a primary school teacher. Yep. Yep. You know, that's how I first went there. Yeah. And that principal and his wife had been there for 11 years before I arrived. Mm -hmm. And the policy they had maintained for 11 years was to flog any child that spoke their language. So, you know, you think of how many generations of children go to a school in 11 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I work with people that went to that school even today. And when it comes to issues of language, there is still what I would call a trauma associated with yeah. it. Yeah, yep. Because... Mm, this is a site of violence for us. Right, I know yeah. I should be able to speak it. I know I should want to. But damage is done. I mean, yeah. You know, it's nearly like there's a, a post-traumatic stress associated with all of this. Yeah, absolutely. And that happened over much of Australia. 
Mm, mm. So this notion of of a physical punishment for possessing knowledge. Mm. You know, I, I sort of think about that. It happened to me with maths. I'm hopeless at maths, but I remember in about grade three, having my head pushed through a blackboard because I wrote 210 wrongly. <gasps> and from that moment on, I thought, maths is a place I don't want to be. Right, yeah. Yep. It was also part because of the teacher. Mm. But, you know, you can translate this notion of wrongness and violence mm. very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I remember when I was a teacher at Borolula, you know, in my first year, I used to, I was slowly introducing language to these little grade one kids. And they knew I was doing wrong. Okay. According to the school. Yeah. Because it's not what teachers do. Right, okay. And they would put a spy outside the window because I was in a caravan school and watch to see if the principal or his wife was coming. <gasps> right. And if we saw them coming, it was like, stop, everyone go back and do something. ABC. Else. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's so sad, isn't it? Yeah, you know, but this is the kind of environment, a fearful environment. Yeah. Where things that should take for granted as being able to be in the land, being in the country, you, you can't take for granted. Mm. But it's, it's really lovely, you know, like that we're... Oh, only been up to the Northern Territory mm. once and drove around, but it's really lovely to hear people, whole families, speaking language. Yes, you know, but of course, it's <laughs> this is none of it should be taken for granted. Mm, mm, you know, if you think mm. that we once had 275 languages, mm. 600 dialects, now we've only probably got 20 languages that are considered strong. Mm, you know, that mm. means all generations are learning them. Mm. Well, that's fine, but then again, the fastest growing Indigenous languages in Australia are the Creoles. Right, yeah, and yeah, yeah. With multiple dialects. Yeah. Um, and changing rapidly. Like, in give those Creoles another 10, 20 years, they will not sound anything like their parent language. They will be completely unique. Well, they already are, but they'll be even more unique indigenous languages with multiple dialects. Right. So that's more hybrid. hybrid well, it's a hybridity, but they turn into something that people own. They're, they're a new language. Yeah, okay. Okay. English, in many respects, is a kind of a Creole. It's had multiple influences. Yeah, you know, yeah. Mm. And we hold it up as a wonderful Global. artistic form. <laughs> mm. Well, Creoles are no different, and Creoles are very exciting languages. It's just the big difference with a Creole is they also arise out of what we call a base language. Mm -hmm. Base language being mm -hmm. the original indigenous languages of the area. Yep. Of the area. And what often doesn't get translated into the Creole are the much more complex knowledges that the base languages hold. Yep. So, for example, in Yanua, you know, there's over 30 different names for Juwan. This is what we call a semantic domain, a domain of meaning of, you're not just talking about a Juwan, you're talking about Juwan-ness or kinds of Juwan. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And in the Creole, they don't get translated. No. They, the semantic domains are too complex to be held by Creole. Yeah, right. So you get reduced to Juwan, and maybe a description in Creole of a kind of Chubong, but not the richness that belongs in that original language. And there's been some interesting research done on this whole idea of what gets translated. And this goes back to the song lines too. Once kids aren't speaking indigenous languages anymore, old people say their mouths get soft mm -hmm. because they're not saying all the sounds because indigenous languages certainly give your mouth a good workout. So it's more from the back of the... Oh, no, it's no, just no. all sorts oh. of... English is a very... <laughs> Soft language. Yeah. You know, well, indigenous languages are full of trilled up. You know, you've got trilled ars, you've got sounds made by the lips, you've got sounds by putting your tongue up against the back of the teeth or between the teeth, you've got sounds that are made in the back of the throat. Your tongue is, and your lips and are doing a whole lot of other things. And some language is of a different kind. Mm. It's not normal everyday language. Mm. So people say, well, it's great they're singing, but they've all got soft mouths. Right, yeah. Because yeah. They're just speaking English. Mm. And the translation of English sounds into Aboriginal sounds is not always easy. So, for example, NG. Yep, yep, yep. You know, we all go sing, sung, song. Yep. We can say NG at the end of a word. Yep. But in many Indigenous languages, NG actually begins a word. Oh, well, I'm just looking looking quickly at my notes here. You know, so... Nalki? Nalki. Nalki. Yeah, there's a good word. Nalki. You know, tell, tell us about essence. that. Essence. Essence. Well, Nalki yep. is... A very complex word. And that starts with NG. It's NG, no, it is no, Nalki. Nalki. Nalki, NG. We mm. don't do that in English at all. No. Okay, it's not something English does. Mm. But for many English speakers, it's really hard to say that sound. Mm. Mm. Let alone trill an R. 
<laughs> Play motor cars and you can do it, but try and put it in a word, it's hard. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Ngalki, what's Ngalki? Ngalki is actually the essence of what a song line is. Like, because it is an essence. So you get dreaming beings traveling over country in whatever form those dreaming beings may be, whether they're a shark, whether they're a groper, whether they're a group of humanoid kind of peoples, whether they're a crow, each one belongs to a clan. Okay, and those clans have an essence, a nalki, that is derived from the activities of those dreaming beings, mm -hmm. that is embedded into the earth and sea that belongs to those things. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. So if you are born from a shark dreaming country, yep, you share the same nalki as the shark. Your essence is part shark. Okay. Okay. Now. It gets more complex. Your most intimate essence is your underarm smell before you put anything on it. No smell, because everyone has a different smell. Right. That is your most intimate own essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like your fingerprint, nearly. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's your own essence, your own nalki. Your next essence is the clan to which you belong. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the group of people through patrilineal descent that you you belong to a clan that has one of these or a number of these dreaming ancestors that gave you country, gave you land. Mm. That's sort of a group, Ngalki. Okay, but the ch uh, a tune of a song is also called a Ngalki. Mm -hmm. The essence of a the song. The essence of the song. And mm. it's either Wari Ngalki or Yabi Ngalki. It's either got a good essence or a bad essence. It's either in a good tune or a bad tune. Okay. So the, it's not the tune is either good or bad based on whether you've captured the essence. The smell of a flower is nalki essence. The taste of food is nalki. Is um, the smell of flower, taste of food. Your voice is unique, so they double that word up and say nalki nalki is your voice, the essence of you that comes out of your mouth. Right. It's a very complex word, mm. but every song line also has essence that belongs to one of those four clans, and it flows through country. That essence flows through country where that song goes. Now, one of the terms they use in Yanua for a good singer is they will describe a good singer as Nalki Wunjayara. Nalki, the essence, Wunjayara swallowing. He is swallowing the essence of the song. He has really got it. He is singing absolutely brilliantly. Mm. That's the tune for somebody that knows how to sing properly, is Nalki Wunjayara. And, um, and this Nalki, of course, is actually really interesting in terms of song lines because, and again, it's about all of a sudden time changes. You know, this nice compartmentalization of past, present, and future that the West has yeah. dissipates here. A linear concept. It's of not all. linear anymore. Great. Because we get this understanding that the dreaming beings traveled over country. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's past tense. We accept that. That happened a long, 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 long time ago. That's why the country is the way it is. Would that be dream time? Sort of? Yeah, that's yep. the dreaming. Yeah, dream, dream, time. dream time sort of a bit non active for me. I like the verb. <laughs> it's dreaming. It's happened. And they're still there in the country, but it happened. Yep. But the song that is put into country is always in the present tense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you cannot mm -hmm. speak of a song line in the annual sense anyway in the f past tense or the future tense. It is right now as you and I sit here, flowing, running, moving through country. Mm -hmm. So all you become as a singer of song lines is the amplifier, amplifier for something that is already pre-existing in the earth. So this notion of past and present collapses and becomes one thing because you are singing something that is eternally present but was laid down in the past, but they're inseparable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So past and present no longer exist as a separate entity. We might have to invent a new term for what the coming together of past and present into one thing is. The now. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's got Eckhart Tolle or something, the now. And that's what I mean. Like in the there is only the now. Is it, there is only the now for a song line. There is no past. There is no future. Well, that's all the thinking. Yeah, and it? even it if the song is never sung again, it's, it is still there. Doing, it still is. It still is coursing its way through country. It makes me think that the song has its own, well, you're saying own, own essence, but its own essence and energy. Well, it like literally is. Before, some of these songs have their own agency where they don't need any being to carry it. They're just 
moving themselves. They don't need the human utterance. Except, it's there. Yeah, but, but the human utterance, of course, is in some respects, when you sing a song line, one of the end results of singing a song line for people, if the song line is sung well, is you revivify country. It's actually an action that will, in Aboriginal English, they often say, lift up the country. The yeah. singing lifts country up, it mm -hmm. celebrates country, it emotionally engages people with a place again. Mm -hmm. So the actual, because that song is also your kin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? mm -hmm. So the song of your paternal ancestors to the clan you belong is your paternal kin as well. Then you will have another song which will be belonging to your mother's father mm. because that's a different clan and then you will have another set of songs that will belong to your mother's mother and then you will have another set of songs that will belong to your father's mother so the singing of any of those songs correctly and properly revivifies country lifts it up re-engages people with place is that what, and is that what it means you hear sometimes hear people say to sing up the country or yeah, sing up the land singing up the land and then walking it, along with making it making the connection but you know some lines don't have to be followed and as we said earlier, mm, mm. no, Getting that. unless you've got an aqualung, you can't follow some of these songs. Right. You know, you could, I have had the experience when I used to live in Brisbane, you know, and I used to bring people from Borrelola across to teach in my courses at UQ. Some evenings, old women would sing song lines that belonged to them just sitting on their deck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or if mm -hmm. they were men, they would be saying, oh, we might just sing that country tonight. And they would sing. But... The emotional engagement was exactly the same. I was going to say, could you feel it still? Yeah, of course, because mm. you're seeing it. Yeah, yeah. Singing from... Well, you're singing yeah, from here, but you're also seeing it. It's seeing, a, a total, oh, seeing it, yeah. Yeah, and the stories are still told. Mm, mm. You don't... This whole notion that somehow song lines can only be sung if you're following them mm. is just another Western imposition, really, mm. of what we think we want them to be. Of a navigational pathway. Of a navigational pathway, or that's what nomads did at the worst. Yeah, no, yeah the nomads. nomads in Boda You know, the power of these songs is the fact that they can be sung anywhere yeah. and still have resonance. Right. And still right. Right. recreate the action of lifting up country, so, you know, of being in country. I was talking to a young fellow the other night, well, young, he's just a bit younger than me, and he works for a mining company. Mm -hmm. And I said, so what do you do when you're in that great big sealed environment driving that big truck? He said, I sing my country and just takes me back. Mm -hmm. Or I might have, because I've given him copies of his father's singing, or I'll put that in my ears mm -hmm. and he takes me back. Mm -hmm. So there's emotional engagement. You know, mm -hmm. it's, these songs are also about a deep emotional resonance. And, but you're, you're saying that, you know, they could sing anywhere, like in Brisbane, yeah, you're saying, and that does still pick up the land. And of course, still, absolutely. So in, like, native title law, when they had to, they had you know, had to prove connection mm. to country, but there's stuff that we really couldn't understand, I, I think. I mean, I didn't do a lot of native title law, I just, when I studied it. But maybe that sort of thing, I wondered if they were well, national travelling or something. This is where we get to a they point, can... and in an academic institutions, some of them have sometimes got to whisper this. <laughs> yeah. But Imagine. there is incrementability, absolute incrementability. There is points in this knowledge that the West will never engage, can't understand. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. just won't mm -hmm. get it. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting mm -hmm. you say land. I've done a number of land claims under the Land Rights Act NT 1976. And the last one I did was with Justice Peter Gray. And he wrote a beautiful document where he said, you know, he's learned enough about the singing of country and why it's so important that he, would, he envisages a meeting between the old people who hold all these songs and the pastoralists. And the, pastoral, and the Aboriginal people say to the pastoralists, on what basis do you own your land? And they will bring out their pieces of paper. And the old men say, but that's just rubbish. You've got no song. You've got no sermon. You know, you've got no body mark. You've got nothing to say this country is yours. And it's likely to be a lease as well. Yeah. It's not even... It's a 99 year lease. Not, exactly. Yeah. And so the way Justice Gray writes about this is so evocative. Mm. You know, he's been around enough to really create the tension that that situation would yeah. embody. Yeah, yeah. And... You know, because Justice Gray was, out of all the land commissioners I ever worked with, he was an extraordinarily 
deep and sensitive judge. He, he can enter those spaces. But as could most of the barristers that were supporting Indigenous people under the Land Rights Act, because it was a, it's a different event than native title. Mm, mm, it's, mm. It's, it's not presumed that you have to prove a link. It's presumed that you are the body of people who are the owners. Right. So right. tell us why you own it. So you don't have to prove that link back no, to, to colonisation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there are other remarkable events mm. and mm. very creative lawyers and barristers and Queen's counsellors and judges. Incredibly. Good, Is, that's good to hear. Good no, they hear. really were. Mm. Mm. And, you know, so when songs were talked about, you know, they could take them for what they were and not try and put an imposition of what we think we want them to be. And I think that's the big issue. And it's one of the reasons why I wrote Singing Saltwater Country, because there was so much trite nonsense around about what we wanted them to be mm. without ever hearing what Aboriginal people thought in their own understanding they are. Well, even the term songlines isn't isn't an Aboriginal term, is it? It's some, isn't well, it some English sort of thing no, that Bruce Chatwell... No, songline actually historically was first used by an Australian anthropologist many, many years ago, actually. Um, I can't remember his name, but he worked in Western Australia. Stanner? No. No, no Stanner. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, but he was the first person to use it. He only used it once or twice. <laughs> then the musicologist Alice, who was married to Strello, first wife of Strello, <laughs> or was at least married, no, not married to, was his research assistant. Okay. She used it mm. for certain things. So they were the first two people to work with Indigenous people and use the term mm -hmm. to begin to understand that there was something going on here. Then, of course, it becomes the super popular Englishman the song lines, you know, there it is. Mm. But that's all very well, but he only looked from the ins outside. He stood at the outside and guessed what they might be. Mm. Mm. But he made the term very popular. Yeah, yeah. But he never really understood what they were. Even by saying song lines, the lines part of it suggests that there's something, you know, in, a, in our Western linear well, like they are a way line. of thinking. Yeah. Like the annual word for a song line that is used more often than the actual specific term for song line, like Gujiga is what it is. Yep. That's yep. what they call it. It's Gujiga. Gujiga, yep. But more often than not, in colloquial, everyday Yanua, they will say, in Yanua, come and follow the road with us. Okay, right. Follow so, the path. Yep. One day ara Ayabala, one day ara tu is following. Ayabala is the path. Okay. One day ara Ayabala, let's follow the path. That's the way it's really always talked about. Okay, right. This term Gujiga gets more complex, though, because Gujiga we can see as the lineage of the so line of the song, if you like. Mm -hmm. You know, Gujiga starts at A and finishes at Z, mm. travels through all these places. But then you could be, even today, I could take you for a walk outside mm. and we might see a crow mm. and I could say to you, that's Gujiga. Okay. Which is a shorthand way, an Aboriginal English way of saying that bird possesses its own verses with inside a song line. Okay, so that's its ngalki again. It's a special kind, it's its ngalki, it's, it's its essence, and because it has um, song, it's also powerful. And in some respects, the singing of a song line of, say, a specific bird like a crow is singing its original beginning. It's like bringing into it its, for its DNA. Okay. It's like its DNA in a sung form, a sound form. Yeah. And you can do this all the time. I do it sometimes on the way home even. You know, you'll see something that will remind you of a song line that you've heard and you know, and you'll just sing that one little verse. Oh, you exactly. know, whether it's you know, a really wagtail, whether it's a storm wind, whether it's a particular feature that's going on. But mm -hmm. you can independently take a verse out of a song line to demonstrate meaning mm, mm, yep. of yep. the importance of something. Mm. Yeah, and people do this, you know, people will say, ah, oh, see that bird? Got a Gujiga, which is, excuse me, sorry. You're right. Well, hello again. After John took the telephone call, we continued our chat, which steadily got deeper into a more philosophical discussion about such things as the difference between Indigenous law, L-A-W, and law, L-O-R-E, that to really understand song lines, you must surrender. We also spoke about colonisation and decolonisation and the incredibly complex Yanua language. Speaking of language, John and the Yanua families have worked tirelessly to compile two volumes of a Yanua language encyclopedia. I will put a link to these on the Songlines Australia website at www.songlinesaustralia.net. 
I'll also put up a link to the Monash Country Lines archive so you can check out the incredible digital animations of some of the Yan Yua songlines. John is currently working on a new book which will focus entirely on one particular Yan Yua songline. So fingers crossed that John may be able to speak with us again sometime about his new book and to more fully explore the other discrete topics we discussed in the latter part of our talk. Before signing off, I'd really like to express my gratitude to John Bradley and the Yanua families for sharing these songs, stories and wisdom with us. Songlines are such an intriguing, complex and fundamentally essential part of the history of this land now known as Australia. We are very lucky to be taught some of this ageless knowledge by the world's longest continuing ancient culture. Thank you for listening to Songlines of Australia. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to this podcast and come with us on an incredible journey following multi-dimensional songlines across country and through time and space.